Thanks very much. All righty. So I'm going to, some of what I have to say is like three steps back at the big picture. Who's doing the flips? You can do the next slide. Somebody flipping them? OK. So I think that there's three different ways that regenerative ranching is especially hopeful. It's hopeful for your land and for your animals. It's very hopeful for the water situation and the climate. And then it's really hopeful for your own spirit and for community. OK, so what we've been looking at is this idea of making the land healthier and healthier. That's fundamentally what regenerative ag means. So when we're out there and we're looking at fence, um, somebody asked, well, did your soil organic matter increase? And these guys haven't tested that. If you've ever seen the short films that, that are called Carbon Cowboys that were done by Peter Bick, they did it through ASU and they did I don't know, maybe like eight vignettes or something like that, maybe more, but people said, well, that's just anecdotal. You know, your pasture isn't really getting better, prove it. So then they went on to a pretty hefty multi-year study, and they've done a film about that too. Um, they brought everybody that they could find that were experts in regenerative grazing to study it. So this is from that study. And keep in mind, this means that some of the operations were higher than this, right? So. This is operations next door to each other or within really close proximity, because they wanted to look at apples and apples. So they did pairs, comparing conventional and intensive rotational grazing across different ecosystems. And what they found was that there was 13% more soil organic matter and then 9% higher soil nitrogen. OK, next. OK, so then what if we don't do this? So this is a picture. Can you tell what it's showing? What is the light yellow? Right. These are areas of, of desert. This is showing desertification. And so sometimes in school you learn that a desert is an ecosystem. Sometimes that's not right. If it's completely devoid of life, that's man-made. So there's arid ecosystems where things grow. But completely dead areas are caused by human beings. And in my 20s, I lived in Central Asia, which is on the, in the middle of the Eurasian landmass there. And you can see the boot of Italy. So in the 1200s, Marco Polo walked, right? He walked. I, I don't know what he had with him. He didn't, I don't know if he had a horse from the Mongols yet. But he goes all the way up across Europe and then into Central Asia. And that becomes the Silk Road in this major trading ground in the 1200s. By the time I lived there, I wondered how was this possible? Because he would have to cross the Talakaman Desert. It's just absolutely desolate all through there, and it's desolate into Afghanistan. How, how was that even possible? And the answer was, as soon as those trade routes really got going, they expanded sheep, goats, yak. You know, they were doing a lot of grazing, and they were doing some grain agriculture, and they just killed it. They killed it, this huge, vast area that was, used to be settled. So that's why you used to be able to walk you know, from Europe into China you know, through Central Asia. And you better not do that now um, for many reasons. But certainly, it's really very dead desert. And oops, let's go back one more again to the desert page. OK, take a look at northern Africa. So northern Africa, that's the Sahara Desert. And underneath that, there's evidence that it used to be pretty much of a, a rainforest. It was incredibly lush and diverse. And so agriculture created the Sahara Desert. And right now, that same thing is actually happening in the Amazon. So the Amazon is being cut down for grazing. And immediately, as soon as they do that, the moisture patterns change right away, dramatically. They'll go down by half. So it goes both ways, too. So I think, really, as we look at this, if you look at where agriculture came from originally, it's Mesopotamia. Where is that on our map? It's the Middle East, so look at Saudi Arabia. Um, one of the ways to think about history is the history of people like the Roman Empire, people in Mesopotamia ruining their soil, and then they have to invade Europe. So if you think about the Roman conquest, were they just sort of mean guys or in a bad mood, or you know, just why did they do this? Why leave home to go fight 
And the armor's heavy. Why would they want to do that? It looked really uncomfortable. But the reason they did that was because they'd wrecked their soil. They have to go and conquer so that they could plant more wheat and barley and do it using bad methods, wreck it, you know, and go on and do the next kind of conquest. So that's a way for us to think about history. And one of the things to keep in mind with that particular history is that before agriculture, which is only about 10,000 years old, people live in essentially permaculture, semi-permanent settlements. They're, they are our height. They live to the same number of years that we live. Then when you get grain agriculture, people get short, sick. There's war. There's social class, you know? And in fact, in a lot of Muslim traditions, the idea of the Garden of Eden and the um, forbidden fruit, the forbidden fruit was wheat. And it was the idea that wheat had knowledge that was forbidden. And you ruin the Garden of Eden by thinking that your knowledge is better than what nature does. So that's just an interesting way to think about history. I think it matters a little bit because our idea of history creates our idea of the present too. So agriculture, the way we've done it, isn't necessarily always an improvement. So I think we're at the end of that paradigm in many places and we need to think about regenerating ways that we can, you know, regenerative land use where we can still do well but we're not leaving the land worse. Next. So I've been doing some webinars on drought with NCAT. We are in Kansas. You can see where we are here that the Ogallala um, aquifer is very important in Texas too and there's parts of it that have just 10 years left for using. Um, drought is throughout the Plain States right now, so water will continue to be a perennial issue. We have to really think long about land use. So I wish that most of Texas was better right now because we just moved from a La Nina to an El Nino, and usually El Nino is wet in the southeast, so I wish that we had more moisture than this right now. Okay, next one. So again, I spent time in my 20s in China and in Central Asia, and my students used to have to do this work study thing out in the desert that you saw there in Central Asia to dig in straw and help put in these little plants to reclaim the desert. Now this is the Las Plateau. It's not in Central Asia, but it's part of a endeavor because China has a lot of desert and they were running out of, you know, land for agriculture. And this is just to show you hopefully, you know, what does it look like? You can go backwards. So that's 8.6 8 million acres. And then they controlled for all sorts of things to be able to confidently say that they got 12% more rain, but they also quadrupled water infiltration and they had a lot more humidity. And you can see, this is exactly the same place. So we can go both directions with our land use. Next. So this is a sign that you might see when we have drought. Next. So I think instead of pray for rain, it's better to plan for rain. So when, when that one study showed 13% more carbon, you know, more soil organic matter, it doesn't sound like that big of a deal, does it? I mean, that's not so high, right? But what does 1% more um, organic matter do in an acre? And that is 25,000 gallons more water in a year from increasing your organic matter by 1%. So that's a lot. We often think of saving water in ponds, right? Water tanks, but the, one of the best places to save it is straight down in our soil. So some of you might have heard of Alejandro Carrillo, who's in the Chihuahua Desert. Um, again, 40% of weather is local. So some of those pictures help you make sense of that when you see the lowest plateau. You know, you think, how could 40% be local? That couldn't be true. But when you see the extremes, it starts to make sense because those are in the same precise places. And down there, they get about four inches more rain since they've started to do rotational grazing in that area. So the idea is to work with nature and not against nature. And for some of you, College students, if you're not familiar with some of the broader argument here, let's look at the next slide. Okay, so the idea is that the grasses that we have on prairies, different, all of the grasses, the grasses themselves evolved to get eaten in short, intense bursts by nervous bison. So the, the bison eat 
and then they stay in a cluster because they're worried about apex predators in a natural system. They eat it, and then they move along, right? And that's the reason that the grasses respond well to this type of a system. So the plains used to have a lot of wolves. There were mountain lions. It's hard to know what all was here. We know that um, Native Americans also changed the plants, the flora, and the fauna pretty extensively. You know, so we're not even sure, but we do know that bison would get taken down by wolves. Um, and so it's that same idea of the football team coming. Go ahead, next slide. So cattle are not an apex predator in the system. Typically, you're not going to find a ruminant that doesn't have a major predator, and it does affect how they eat grass. So if they have the entire, if your operation is a great big buffet for them, they're just going to eat down the best stuff. They don't move and they don't eat the way that they would. Um, not even if we, we don't even have to think about how they evolve, but how the grasses evolve. The grasses evolve getting eaten down and then moved off. So Dale thought the tastiest thing out there right now is the switchgrass. What's that? What's the tastiest thing out there now, switchgrass? Probably Indian grass. Or Indian grass, rather, yeah. So they would then go just out. Go yeah, they would just eat that and leave everything else. But if there's an apex predator around, it doesn't take many of them, then they move differently. And you might have heard the study that was done in Yellowstone when they reintroduced the wolves. It really changed the whole ecosystem because animal behavior changed. And animals also don't muck up water. They don't hang out there with their heads down when there's an apex predator. So it has all sorts of effects. So that's the reason when we say we're mimicking nature. What's natural about moving polywire? Nothing. Polywire doesn't exist in nature. It could be from God, but it's not in nature. Um, but it mimics that kind of movement. Okay. Okay, so then this question that I asked about the dung beetles. So dung beetles preferably follow bison or cattle. Now dung beetles can lift more than a thousand times their weight. They gallop rather than run. They're the strongest creature that there is. They can fly 30 miles. I could probably, you know, in a day, I wouldn't fly 30 miles, but I could walk or run 20 miles, but I wouldn't want to. So they can go far distances, but if they're flying, it's stress on them. They prefer to follow, right, a group of animals. So this is a secret to having a healthy ranch, is to make sure you have these people on your team, the dung beetles. So let's look at the numbers for dung beetles. You have 130% more water infiltration when you have a healthy dung beetle population. That's a lot, right? And it's free, right? So they tend to be underestimated because they're just bugs, right? They're just beetles, but they are burying that manure. So you should have all of that manure getting buried down. Um, and then you'll have 30% more forage productivity on a pasture with a healthy dung beetle population. That's huge, isn't it, right? So what if you could buy a breed of cattle that would definitely gain on the same forage and get 30% more, everybody would be all over it, right? So that's what I want you to think about with the dung beetles is that in nature, they're gonna follow the cattle, they're gonna take care of all that manure, and then that's a 30% bump up in your forage. Now, if you've ever used ivermectins, that'll kill them from between two and six months. That's what the manufacturers will say it'll do. So you have to replace them. It's pretty easy to decimate them um, with different kinds of um, medicines that we can give to cattle. So bring them back. Adam told me that there's um, a closed Facebook group where people exchange dung beetles. Adam? Dung beetle what? It's called dung beetle, dung beetle exchange. exchange. Yeah. So hopefully we can collectively, as you know, a country of ranchers, make this something that's more systematic. Dale once brought dung beetles from one place to another, and um, he decided you need to have at least five or 600 to reestablish a population. So you can just get you know, one of those tubs, put a, bunch, um, put a bunch of them in, and put them behind your cattle and reestablish them, because that's a lot. So that's what nature will do for you. So what happens if we don't make some of these changes? Anybody ever seen something that looks like this? Anybody? Hands? So we saw some coming down in Kansas where it isn't even that dry, right? So there's a couple of different stories behind this and um, the effects of it. So what is in that? 
What's in the sky there? Topsoil. Top okay, dust, topsoil. Okay, next. So what is it about dust? So if you have bare ground, you're not growing forage, and that's a problem. If you have bare ground, you're also are susceptible to having that earth go straight up and become part of those clouds. So it happens certainly with tillage, but it also happens in overgrazing. Okay, if there's a lot of overgrazing, you're gonna see these dust clouds. So there's sort of an urban legend left around that dust can create rain. There have been huge amounts of studies in the last five years on rain making. So what is a good aerosol, what is bad? The money actually came from the Defense Department because they were worried about bacteria, viruses, you know, what are the things that float in the air and how far do they go and stuff like that. So just five years, massive amount of research on it. So what do we know about actual dust? Dust is usually a combination of a mineral with a little bit of um, organic matter to it. It's little tiny. So what happens if it's just purely mineral, water can't form around it. It doesn't have the right shape to sort of dissolve itself around it. So what we call dust is usually a mineral with a little bit of organic matter. And the important thing is that they're little. So the water droplet goes onto it, but because it has a lot of surface area, it evaporates. And then it will like reform. Does that make sense, everybody? Like little kids get colder than adults because they have more surface area. So it's smaller, it has more surface area, it'll form a droplet and then it'll evaporate. And then they're further apart. It's harder for them to crash into each other to form bigger ones. And up there in there is also the things that are bigger and make healthy raindrops, which is things that come from nature, which would be something like pollen or a fungal spore. So I'm a fungal spore. I have to find my way among all the dust particles you know, to try to get a hold of my rain droplet, and it's harder to form. Dust suppresses rain. It creates haze. It will make rain under certain circumstances where you get a heat dome, and it creates an upward flow, it'll make a rain, and it tends to make one of those big, heavy, hard rains that a lot of land can't fully make use of, and it goes off. You're not gonna get all of the rain when it's those big, heavy, hard rains. It'll sit up there, it creates very bright clouds, and it'll create haze, right? So its net effect is to inhibit rain and to make those intense rains. Okay, the next one. So this is a common research finding. They call it normal. If you're somebody who studies this, there's normal rain, which is something that is um, regular and slow and steady. And these hard, fast rain, rains are not um, to the people who do the research. <laughs> they're not normal. You know, they come basically from pollution. OK? OK, next. So but what's called a biogenic aerosol is what would drive the hydrological cycle. So what does that mean? Next. OK, so the things that, are, that become a condensation nuclei that makes a good raindrop come from nature. The number one thing is a fungal spore, and then pollen, and then bacteria that come from the surface of plants. Have you ever seen those spots that are on plants that will be like on a sunflower? Right, that's a, a bacteria that also can become one of these aerosols. Um, and even things that do come from um, like animals and cats and dogs. But it's, it literally, it won't rain cats and dogs when it's from cats and dogs. It rains cats and dogs when it's from dust. So that's a correction there. All right, so again, those are the most common examples. Next. Okay, so this matters for your operation, because if you have a healthy pasture and you have a lot of different species and your older seed beds are coming back, right, and you have Illinois bundle, bundle flower, you have types of prairie grasses that haven't been seen in, you know, decades, the more diversity you have, you also have diversity of pollen. The pollen is coming in at different times. Does that make sense? You want pollen to be steady instead of, some, when you have a smaller number of species, you only get a rain from pollen when that's happening. And you also want to have shade. You want to keep some trees around. And you want to have some pretty thick undergrowth, not bare soil, because that's a place where little tiny funguses can grow, and they make rain. So the more biodiverse your operation is, 
the more biogenic aerosols it's letting up, and the more that promotes rain. And half of those stay local. This is a good reason for all of us to improve our land together, because it takes between five and 50 miles to create your local weather system. Between five and 50. So it also has to do with, you know, with wind patterns and things like that. So we have a friend that grows um, compost worms, red wigglers, and he has five acres indoors, and it rains inside of his place in, indoors, you know, because it's this little protected area with a lot of earth. So you can create a microclimate. And if you get enough people in, in your area adding to this, it's going to help, right? Half of them go very far, very fast, but half of these biogenic aerosols stay local. So you want to do your oper manage to put rain in the soil to infiltrate it, but related to that is that plant diversity to help make rain and prevent dust, right? Dust inhibits rain. Okay, next. So this is a graph that shows heavy rainfalls from 1905 to 2005. Let's listen to the sound of heavy rainfall. <laughs> it's raining outside. So we've had a lot more of it. It's an issue for many people in many places that even if their rainfall is, is staying similar in totals, they're getting it, a lot of people are getting it in heavy doses. It's also made worse because when it's hotter at the, um, the difference between the equator and the Arctic is, is closer, the jet stream isn't as dynamic, it moves slower, so it's sluggish. So that's a, a macro factor of climate that makes those more intense heat domes, more intense storms more likely. Okay, next. Okay, so the second half then is also about us. So for us to work together well as a community, it means bringing more people on, being able to understand what gets in our way when we decide um, that we don't want to make a change. So these are the things that actually make people happy. Americans tend to think that it's more money, but actually that isn't true. You just need enough money so that you don't have to worry about having your basic needs met. Enough to keep you from anxiety is all that you need. And when people get a bunch more money, they're happier for about three months and then it goes away. So enough, right? If you want to prospering and steadiness matter. So safety is important for happiness. Having predictability on some level is happiness and farming and ranching tends to be a profession with a lot of unpredictability in it. Regenerative ranching and farming is way more predictable, way less safety risk. There's more in your control. Um, feeling like you have a purpose so that you're doing meaningful and interesting work People are happier when you feel like you're doing better. And it's nice when you feel like you're on a trajectory with your farm or your ranch where you're pretty sure it's gonna keep getting better and better. That feels good. And then connection, right? Close, close connection with friends, family, community. Okay, next. So the most unpredictable element on a ranch is the rancher. And what makes the most difference in being successful isn't land you inherited or how much money you have or how smart you are or good looking. It's your emotional resilience, it's grit. That's the most important thing. So that means emotional habits make it the biggest difference. Next. So these are the dimensions, growth. Everybody who's here gets points for growth right away, right? That you're open to new ideas or alternatives, that you're learning in a continuous way. Resilience, the capacity to respond constructively to adversity, that's a tough one. Instinct, your gut level capacity to pursue the right goals. Okay, so that can get in our way. We'll talk more about this in the next several slides. And tenacity, sticking with it. Okay, next. So we're gonna talk about that if we have emotional grit. Okay, next. So these are the two most important things, I think, is that you wanna create a virtuous circle ecologically on your ranch. So when you have more 
soil, carbon. You have more water, you have better forage, right? And, and then you have more moisture, means you have more plants. It creates a virtuous circle. Um, it seems like sometimes when you start that it can't get better, but it will. So it also, you have to have patience when you're transforming pasture because it, it often takes four years to really go from um, a beaten down pasture to something that's revitalized, especially after drought. So there is definitely some skill to it. Um, but we also want to have a virtuous circle for us emotionally, that the better we can respond to challenges, the better able we are to do it, right? It, it, it makes us happier and more effective. Next. Oh, back one. Okay, so about 15 years ago, I has, had a couple of doctoral students that were doing soil education dissertations, and they were really good. Um, and I thought, well, this is great. We know pretty much everything that we need to know to revitalize ranching, to regenerate um, row crop ag agriculture, it will take three years and all of this will be finished. You know, everybody will want to do this because why wouldn't they? You can save money, um, you have lower inputs, you can um, often grow hi higher crops or run more cattle. So I became interested in this um, over many years, this question of why isn't everybody doing this? So for tillage, we have Four-fifths of operations are still using tillage. Um, and you can drive around anywhere where there's ranching and you can see um, overgrazed pastures, right, that are going to really struggle to get out of the hole. So why doesn't everybody do this? These are the big four. So one is being able to manage fear that it seems too risky. The other one is social, not wanting to have those communal needs that are so important, right? You don't want to be seem strange to your neighbors. Um, another one has to do with self-esteem. Does it mean you were doing things badly before? Sometimes when you change, right, you have to sort of respond to the previous self. How do you deal with that emotionally? And also the idea of justice and injustice, that people can feel like they were burned by a certain new idea before. You know, and now this is the latest new thing. Okay, next. So what happens when you're having an emotional reaction to something is that inside of us, we are a lizard, and on top of that, we have a mammal brain, and then we have a logical frontal, frontal cortex stuck right on top of that. And for anything emotional, we can get hijacked, right, by our lizard brain. And we don't, we are really driven by fundamental fears of fight and flight. Okay? That's our more primal brain, if our a sense of danger, if we're threatened. Next. So these are the ways that it can go wrong. So with fear, um, with safety, you can avoid risk. Anybody that's had a feeling of unsafety or unpredictability can become risk averse or can be hyper riskers, risk takers. There's a lot of farmers and ranchers at gambling casinos. So maybe the same colleague of yours that doesn't want to try something new agronomically also gambles. Well, if you look at it from a psychological point of view, it's somebody that's had safety trauma, right? It makes you either hyper risk taking or you don't take enough risk. And then those are the other two, or three rather. Esteem, you can give up too easily. You can become a success addict. And then connection. You can become people-pleasing or isolate, and then justice. You can become completely apathetic or volatile. You can go one more. So there it is, just put in relationship to fight and flight. Next. So this can be hard to know when we're not being rational. But I think this is really, really important in an emotionally demanding career like ranching. It is emotionally demanding. It's unpredictable. It is. You can't predict commodity prices. You can't predict weather. You can't always predict when and how you're going to sell something. Um, it's a lot is regularly out of your control, isn't it? Even if you decide to buy a certain kind of animal, is it for sale when and you need it? There's so much that is out of your control. OK, let's look at that one. So this is very common for, for farmers and ranchers. They have, it's the most 
unpredictable safety trauma causing profession there is. High risk medicine, you know, like being a cancer doctor is second. You guys are in the most, you know, the least safe, right? It's the least likely to assure you neurologically that everything is fine. And it helps to start off knowing that, doesn't it? So we often hear about farmer suicide, rancher suicide, rural mental health issues. We can peel these back, understand what they are, and have strategies um, for dealing with them. And if you have colleagues, friends, that you're trying to help them change their practice, or you're partway through, and you have some of these kinds of feelings come up, this will help you understand how people have resistance. OK, the next one. So for safety, these are five strategies that can really help overcome that for people that are risk averse. So this one is called Eat the Frog. There's a book with that name. And it means that you start the day and the week with whatever you least want to do, which I guess is eating a frog. You know, so for some people, like mucking out a grain bin would be really gross. If you've ever done that, it smells bad. I would rather do that than do tax stuff. For me, it's like financial stuff. I have an over crazy irrational fear related to some of my money bureaucracy, right? And that comes from, right, a safety trauma. But if you know whatever the, your triggery things are that make you want to avoid it, this is just a strategy. Do that early in the day. Do it early in the week, put it on the list. When you get it done, it's not on your shoulder anymore, making fun of you, you know, an avoided task. You know, you're like, dang, I couldn't believe I avoided that so long. That took an hour, right? Has anybody ever had that happen? Some avoided task, you feel haunting you, and then you get it done, and you're like, I should have done that months ago. So that's a strategy for, for that, because it's avoidance, right? And then, so you get two benefits. It stops haunting you, and then you get dopamine, task completion. So these are kind of like dog training tips, you know? But seriously, human beings are habitual people, right? And when we get hijacked by fear, you're training your inner lizard, your inner mammal. So these are things that require habit, and they can really change your emotional orientation. But you have to literally treat it like dog training. Do it habitually. So if you try this, this is something to do. Every week, every day, what do I least want to do? Get it done. OK, next one. So this is, seems simple, but anybody that's ever run a farm or a ranch has a long list of stuff you have to do. Has anybody caught up on everything? Anybody ever? You're like, it's never going to end, right? And that just makes you feel like you're failing, even if you're not, because you just, you're noticing you're attending all the time to the undone tasks. So this is just a suggestion every day you write down what you got done, OK? And it trains you to say, you know, I'm winning. Like, I'm getting stuff done. I'm getting stuff done. It's a little tiny habit. Every day, this is what I got done. And it reassures you on that lizard level. You know, it calms your, your body down. Fear is this thing that kept all of us alive. The chances that we're alive compared to all of our ancestors that got eaten by tigers or what other bad things happened to them? I don't know. They didn't save enough food. You know, the, the people that didn't worry as much, they did not survive. Okay, so all of us have survived because the warriors are like, I better like, I better you know close up the cave or you know fortify the cabin or store more food. All the anxious people survived to tell the tale, right? So it's a it's when when a human being or a mammal or a lizard gets scared of something, it never forgets it on your body level. You have to create a new track. So Dale was talking the other day about a bull calf that always hated you, that you chased down. You know, so if you scare an animal, they never forget you, right? But we're the same way. Even if our logical mind knows we're safe, we just still have these visceral reactions, OK? So these are ways to, to retrain some of these reactions that can get in the way of how we run our farm and our ranch and our life. So do a done list. Next one. All right, gratitude list, daily. So this is something where you're not just haphazardly thinking through it. Write down, it doesn't have to be a lot, four or five things at least four days a week. If you do it for six weeks, you train yourself emotionally and spiritually to notice the good things, right? Because we're, we're never in a situation where everything is bad. 
I require my students to do this. I have a self-care class that I teach. I, I make them do it, and they resent me in the beginning. At the end, they always say, wow, this was great. I now feel optimistic. And they start to notice smaller and smaller things. It starts to be, it's usually like my family, my health, fast food, you know, something like that. But then it will be, you know, I saw a really pretty blackbird sitting on the fence, or just tiny things. It attends you to notice blessings. So this is a practice that can calm that lizard. Because if your lizard doesn't notice the blackboard, the blackbird, and your frontal cortex is telling it stuff to worry, it, re it revs you, your whole system up. So gratitude lists. And then knowing about the lizard, right? Just consciously, when you find yourself anxious, just saying, you know, lizard, you, you're just trying to scare me, go, go away. Like label it, right? Just depersonalize. Does anybody ever have an irrational fear? So it's really common for people to fear, fear homelessness. In my 30s I did, which was crazy, it didn't make sense, but it was just like, I would worry that, you know, I would lose all my money and I'd have bad dreams about not having housing. You know, so people often have these like ruminations. Again, that's part of that anxiety thing. But if you, if you know that you have, um, if you have that just helping, thinking literally of a lizard, and it depersonalizes it, right? Just say, I don't believe you, lizard. <sighs> it's not true, okay, next. So that's just an example. Um, he's laying there thinking, I wonder if I should add radish to my cover crop mix. <laughs> Right, laying awake with persistent fears, you know. So that'll happen to people when there's a lot going on, but, you know, if you find yourself over worrying, just know, you know, just don't worry that you worry, right? That helps. Knowing that it's just the lizard in you trying to scare you, understanding that it helped all your ancestors be alive can help. Okay, next. So another thing that's really helpful for this dopamine, um, is to have a mission statement. Adam has a mission statement for his ranch, correct? Where's Adam? True or false? You guys have a mission statement, don't you? Yeah. So, um... <laughs> well, so this, is, this comes from a sod farm that we went to, and in their workroom, they had their mission statement up, and then they had the five principles of soil health. So, as a creature, 75% of our sensory apparatus is visual. So visual reminders really help us if we see that. So put, make a mission statement, put it up, read it regularly, and it will inspire you. It will give you that half full feeling. It's an important thing. Make yourself do some of these little things that, that improve your resilience, your grit. Next one. So this one comes from a produce farmer. Can you guess if it was written? It's a, it's a vision board. Can you guess if it was a male or a female? <laughs> so a female person did this. But you know, my boy students do them too. Um, but it make, also you can do a vision board and put it up of your best pictures of how you envision your life and your operation being. And again, because you see it every day, your mammal sees it and your lizard sees it and they're like, wow. It's, things are good. It doesn't know that you're just looking at the vision board. It really is a way to sort of trick yourself out, you know, in a, in a sensory way. So it works. Consider a vision board. Okay, next. This is very important, is to track progress. Take pictures. So some people take pictures of the same pasture, you know, like seasonally or at least once a year, because when you make changes, you forget what it was like before. And it's very reinforcing when you can document the changes for yourself. So do infiltration tests, it's cheap. You know, you can just hammer in those circles and do an infiltration test in places, take photographs, and then notice them, praise yourself. Like, notice your own progress, because regenerative ranching is a journey. And again, we, we tend to acclimate towards the next thing on the horizon instead of what is it today, right? And what's the progress that I've made? That's why people, with our kids, we put those little, you know, things that we do up against the wall about their height, you know, because we forget, you know, what they looked like last year. So consciously track progress. And then it's, it'll be a really big dopamine hit, 
and it increases your sense of meaning. Next one. So this one is really common. Americans are really famous for various forms of self-hatred. <laughs> it's true. A lot of people feel like, have an inner voice that they could be doing better. This is a cultural phenomena for us. It's not true across every culture. But it can get in the way if you feel like what you did before was bad. OK, next slide. So you want to notice if you have an inner voice that criticizes you. So I read about the inner voices. Has you ever heard of an inner dialogue that you have where you say bad things to yourself? Can anybody relate to this? You know what this means? OK. I didn't think I had one, and then later I realized it was my entire personality. It's like, whoa. <laughs> so the idea is to talk to yourself the way that a good, you would talk to a good friend. Right? Would a good friend insult you or saying, God, you should have, you know, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have made that mistake. Your inner voice will do it. Notice when you're doing it to yourself. Don't let you treat you the way you wouldn't treat a good friend. Okay? And this, again, is dog training. It's a habit. My voice, I think, is my grandmother because she calls me Miss Betsy. It's like, oh, Miss Betsy, you lost your keys again. You know, it's this voice. It's been around a long time. Notice it. And don't let that inner voice, you know, discourage you. Create a positive coach inside of your mind. Because this is one of the barriers to changing your practice, right? It's your feelings of, of esteem. So that's a picture where you can do the negative voice on one side and the positive one next. So people in farming often have a feeling of injustice. Has anybody ever heard of a bad policy, bad farm policy. Nobody's heard of one. Something that had unintended consequences. <laughs> well, there you go, right? So that's, a, that's another feeling that's completely reasonable. Um, I was in Indiana during the hog crisis. It was awful, right? The decade before that, people were losing farms left and right because it was big, get big, get out. There's a huge amount of trauma in rural America, folks. Massive. Right? It's weather, it's policies, it's one thing after another. We've lost rural communities. It's really, really hard. Right? So a lot of us carry this you know, just residual feeling that things have been unfair, and they have been. Right? But you don't want to let that get in your way of something that could be something new that is under your control and your decision to do, you know, that's, that will ultimately help you. So this is a picture that shows Vanguard and BlackRock were the um, ultimate beneficiaries of the pesticide and fertilizer. Um, $38 billion. They went from 18, 19 billion in 21 to 38 billion in 22. Right? So that seems to be an injustice, perhaps, right? With who's winning. So this is also a way for us to take back our financial power too, right? To take over, you know, really, to take better control over our, our finances and the destinies of our, of our communities. So who has been winning? So we've got investors like Vanguard and BlackRock and cities, input suppliers, food processors, um, and then who, who's on the losing end in the status quo? Agriculture. Next. So this is a way to flip a lot of the flow. So if you don't have, if you have lower fertilizer, fuel, herbicide costs, then you have more money that's staying on the ranch and staying in the community. That's OK. We're almost done. So we were, um, I think it was just a week ago, we were in a town in Kansas where the grocery store had left and the people of the town came together and they argued about what to do and they tried to get another grocery store to come in. Ultimately, they sold shares to create their own new grocery store at $250. Some people in the community own $250 worth of the new grocery store. Some own $250, um, $25,000. They came up with half a million dollars. They opened a beautiful store. They sell a lot of local food there. Um, Dale, where were we? Where was that? Axtell, Kansas. Axtell, Kansas. Yep. So invest in your own community, right? When, when we want to grow our farm, grow your organic matter. Dale always says grow your farm 
from the ground up instead of horizontally, right? Grow the productivity of your forage so that we don't always feel that we're competing with each other and you know, trying to get somebody else's land. Um, so creating a local food system is certainly part of that, but also having more freedom from paying those bills. If you don't have to maintain as much equipment, right? If you're not buying as much um, fertilizer, you don't have as many fuel costs, those are what Dale was talking about. Those are practical, they're money, but they're also freedom and they're community development. Next, next, next. Okay, that was that weirdo. So when you're doing regenerative ranching, um, you know, people might gossip about you that you're doing something different. Some people try something new on acreage that nobody can see from the road, you know, so no one knows that you're trying it. Um, next, but when you're in regenerative ag, you get a new community right here. This is a community right here. So even if your immediate neighbors or some of your family don't support it, you know, and it feels like there's an isolation involved, you also have a team. And the more of us that can do it in a region, it helps us revitalize our land enough that we can start to refill wells, right? Change our local weather. It matters to have friends locally to talk about. Because also, people near you have similar soil and similar plants. So that was also part of our plug is, you know, Dale and I will come out and consult for half price with regenerative wisdom if we can get like five people to do it because we really want to see entire communities changing. And we are at a new moment with regenerative act where it's moving from just an individual rancher, you know, person by person to community level regeneration. And between 2017 and 2021, there was a doubling of regenerative practice. So it's starting to be a J-shaped curve, right? So we want, to be, we want this beautiful community and this wonderful ranch to be one of those points of hope where we can bring a whole group together and really change practice, right? And improve our farms and have a more hopeful future and really have more power and freedom too, right? Yes? Yes, amen. Okay, that's it. I think that's it, yeah. Oh, so here's forms of power that we need to do that. So we need knowledge, right? Technical assistance, that matters. We also have to have that personal empowerment, right? We have to have that too. We need power of example. It's nice to visit different operations. It's nice to visit someone who's only two or three years ahead of you. Because sometimes if you go to somebody who's been doing it for 20 years, I've had that experience and I feel like we will never get there, right? So decide who your example is. You need a personal, a couple of personal examples to be your mentors. There are a couple steps down the road in, in the progress that they're making. And you also collectively as a community want to look at what are other communities doing. As we have water policy issues coming down the road, every community should be prepared with what we want to do, you know? You don't want people coming in and telling you how to use your water resources. Have those conversations with your community before it gets to that point. Story power, so what kind of stories motivate us? Um, what kind of stories do we want to tell? Sometimes the stories are positive stories, sometimes they can be cautionary tales. You know those dust clouds can be a cautionary tale. Um, alliance power, who do we work with? So who are the nonprofits? Who are the people in conservation, extension that we can work with that can help us? Um, organized local power, do we locally are there things we can do better in a group or as a community? Do we want to go in on some equipment? Um, do we want to meet informally? That's a kind of local power, right? You know, do you want to meet regularly? Some communities pass their own community policies related to water um, or agriculture. And very far at the bottom of that is state and national power, where we say, you know, how can we use or influence state and national power? So we never want to let that bottom one make us feel immobilized, right? We have all of those other forms of power to take charge of our lives and make better communities and be, be more autonomous during this really transformational time. Now I'm really done. Okay.